Hi everyone. Welcome to Wild Voices Online. We're going to get started in a few minutes. We'll just give everyone a moment to log in and join us for today. Um, while we're waiting, I have a question to ask you for fun to see if you know the answer to this one. Our theme for today's presentation is going to be animal survival instincts. So I have a question about an interesting animal survival instinct. Okay, our question for today is how many quills does a porcupine have? 30, 300, 3,000, or 30,000? What do you think? How many quills does a porcupine have? It's an animal that we can find here in BC. They have a very interesting protection mechanism of all these pokey, spiky quills on their body. And how many of those does a typical porcupine have on its body? 30, 300, 3,000, or 30,000. All right, um, welcome to everyone who's just joined us. While we're waiting for people to log in, I just have a question up there to see if you can guess the answer. How many quills does a porcupine have? 30, 300, 3,000, or 30,000? See if you can take a guess. Okay, we'll give it uh, just a few more moments um, while people are joining us here. I'll give it about probably 10 more seconds to, if you haven't guessed already on the question there of how many quills does a porcupine have, go ahead and take a guess. And your options are 30, 300, 3,000, or 30,000. Let me know what you think. Okay, we'll give it 10 more seconds from here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what you said. Okay, this is a pretty tricky question. So we'll see the, um, for how many quills does a porcupine have? Not very many people guessed 30. That's not very many quills. Got some guesses for 300. Most people guessed 3,000. And then some people also guessed 30,000. Porcupines have 30,000 quills on their bodies. Isn't that amazing? 30,000 is a good guess because that's still a lot of quills, but those porcupines can have 30,000 quills on their bodies. That's amazing. Okay, so we will get started for today. My name's Christine. I work for the Columbia Basin Environmental Education Network. And in May and June, we have been doing some online presentations for students called Wild Voices Online. We have just uh, two more coming up in June after this one. You can find them at cbean.ca slash wildvoicesonline if you're interested and want to sign up for those. Um, we also have all the recordings of the sessions that have already happened posted up there as well. So if you missed any or you want to watch one of them again, they are all up and posted on cbean.ca slash wildvoicesonline. So for how this presentation will work, you are muted, which means we can't see or hear you. So if you want to ask a question, you can click the little speech bubble that looks like this on your screen and you can type your question to us. And your questions will only be seen by myself and today's presenter. Um, I'll ask your questions for you when we get to a good pause point uh, where the presenter is ready to take some questions. Um, so please be patient with be patient with your question. Only ask it once. I promise I'll have seen it. Um, but there's lots of you joining us today. We'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as you can, but we might not have time for all of them. But when we have a good moment to pause and answer some questions, we'll do our best to answer uh, as some that came in. Okay. So a quick question before we get started. Of, I just want to know what grade you are in, students who are joining us. What grade are you in? Kindergarten, grade one, grade two, three, four, five, six, or grade seven and up. You can let us know. What grade are you in? Okay, thanks. I see most people have let us know. I'll give you uh, just five more seconds from here to let us know if you haven't already. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Um, we have some kids grow joining us from every grade today. Welcome everyone. Um, most, it looks like the most from grade two, but it was super close. We have someone joining us from every grade today. Okay, 
So in a moment, I'll pass it over to our presenter for today. Uh, Patty is joining us from Kimberly, and she's going to talk to us about some fascinating animal survival instincts. All right, I'll uh, pass it over to you, Patty. All right, thank you. Just going to get my uh, screen going here. All right. Let me know, Christine, if you can see that. We can see your screen. Okay, Patty, thanks. Okay, great. So good morning, everyone. My name is Patty Kolesnichenko, and I am an outdoor environmental educator, and I live in Kimberley. And I have the pleasure to work at many different places uh, throughout the basin. I work as an outdoor teacher at St. Mary's Catholic in Cranbrook. I also work for WildSite, um, and I've been working there for many years and mainstreams. Um, also with the Kootenai Community Bat Project and Wild BC. And of course, I work as a community educator with Seabean, teaching the Animal Survival Instincts program that I'm going to be talking to you about today, and also the All About Bats program. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. And I'm also so honored uh, to be able to take students out, um, out onto this beautiful landscape, um, the territory of the Tanaha people. So I'm so grateful for that. So moving right along here. Um, so our topic today is animal adaptations. And so an adaptation is something that an animal has on its body or does or has on basically on the inside uh, that helps it survive. Um, this uh, often happens over many years. So it could happen over hundreds or thousands or millions of years and uh, it takes a long time. So animals and their adaptations, it just doesn't happen overnight. And also these adaptations match the, the environment that the animal lives in. Um, and for some of you, you might be looking at uh, biomes. And so uh, a biome uh, is basically a, a geographical area that has a, a unique um, climate, it has unique terrain, uh, and also the animals and plants that live there and thrive there are unique as well. So I thought I'd just talk really briefly about biomes and ecosystems because they kind of go hand in hand with animal adaptations. Um, so the largest biome on our planet is the ocean, is that marine biome. And it covers 70% of our planet. Um, and as we probably all know, that biome is, is experiencing a lot of challenges with climate change, with some of our um, land use practices and plastics and things like that. So we really need to, to, to protect those biomes um, so that those animals that are living there um, can survive and thrive in plants as well, of course. The other biome uh, within those aquatic biomes are the freshwater biomes. And that might be something we are more connected with because we live uh, in the Columbia Basin here uh, and we're surrounded by lakes and rivers and streams and wetlands and marshes um, and ponds. And so those biomes have unique uh, features as well and also unique animals uh, that live there and plants that live there as well. The next group of biomes is the desert biome. And when we look at that picture of the desert biome with the cactus and the sand and, and those real small, smaller type trees, um, you think of hot and arid, uh, lot, not a lot of precipitation. So the animals that live there have to be well adapted um, in order to survive there. So a lot of the animals and plants are often nocturnal in particular, they come out at night or they bloom at night uh, because that's when it's cooler. Other biomes are a grassland biome uh, and here in Kimberley um, we have, we kind of share a few different ecosystems, one being a grassland that's near us. And grasslands take up 1% of the land mass in, in British Columbia and within that grassland ecosystem um, a lot of endangered animals and plants live there. So it's a, it's a very sensitive area, um, lots of grasses and, and, and plants and insects and animals. Uh, but very few trees because uh, that landscape doesn't really support that. 
Um, moving on to trees, it's the forest biome, and I have three pictures there that show the different types of biomes um, uh, within a forest uh, biome that might be a rainforest or a jungle uh, ecosystem, um, a boreal ecosystem, and then also more related to where we are, um, and maybe some of you in different areas, um, a, a temperate zone. Um, so different levels of rain, uh, heat, uh, and also terrain. And so the animals that live there are well adapted to that environment. And last one is the tundra. And we have the Arctic tundra, uh, which is a very unique landscape, very cold. And I used to live near that area in the tundra. So it's, it's quite beautiful. Uh, and the animals that live there are well adapted to surviving in those environments. And then also a mountain tundra. So that high alpine uh, tundra, where the same kind of temperatures and uh, similar sort of plant uh, um, growth that happens up there and the animals that live there have to be really well adapted to living in that type of environment. So let's move on and talk a little bit about um, animal adaptations and it's such a big area when we talk about um, animal behavior um, and um, but there, I wanted to simplify it a little bit for everyone and that there are three main sort of categories. And the first one is behavior. So when we think of the word behavior, we think of behave. So how does an animal, what does it do to survive? So these are all the things that animals do to survive. And it's probably the one adaptation that's that can change more easily over time. And, and I'll talk really briefly about that once I describe um, what that means. So a behavioral adaptation could mean how an animal would curl up to hide, um, how an animal builds a lodge or a dam, building a, de a den or a burrow. Also hibernation is an example of behavioral adaptations. Migration, so, um, and I'll back up a bit. So hibernation, for those that are, are maybe not familiar with that, hibernation is when an animal um, will go to sleep, um, their whole respiratory system, so their breathing and their heart rate all slows down um, so that they can go into a deep sleep. And their body systems sort of start to shut down a little bit. Uh, and often those animals, in particular like the bear, um, that we're probably most familiar with when we talk about hibernation, they'll spend right now in the spring and summer and fall storing up, eating lots of food um, so that they can survive um, over the winter when there's not a lot of food for them. So they hibernate. Um, and in terms of behavioral adaptation, often uh, in communities where bears come into, one of the things that they have um, ch and changed their adaptation is that learned behavior. So when we put out garbage and when uh, we have fruit trees, they've learned uh, over time that they can come into our communities and do that. So it's really important that we, we help those bears uh, so that they don't learn that behavior. Also, migration is another example of a behavioral adaptation. And so migration is when an animal leaves an area uh, to go to maybe find food or where it's warmer or to have their young, uh, and then they'll come back. So examples are geese, caribou, um, fish do this as well, salmon. Uh, so these are examples of behavioral adaptation. And instinct is also an example. And that's something that is a drive or something that they're born with, um, that it's sort of innate and that it's, it's just kind of part of who they are. And the last one, as I mentioned with the bear, is that learned behavior. And you can see uh, the, the, the mom with her cubs uh, fishing for salmon, that the bears, they, they are kind of, they're, they're born being omnivores, um, but they're not born being great hunters. It's, the, it's their mom that teaches them to be a great hunter so that they can ensure that they survive. So that's a, a behavioral adaptation. The next one is a physical or structural adaptation. 
And this one happens over a long period of time. And what's happening is it's changing the animal's genetic traits, so it's DNA. And uh, these adaptations are usually uh, part of their body and then it's shown through their body like camouflage. So their fur blending in with their environment like that snowshoe hair. Mimicry is also an example of a physical or structural adaptation. And mimicry, a good example of that is uh, when an animal kind of imitates another animal that might have a poison or might have something about it that predators kind of steer clear from. So that animal will imitate that other animal so that uh, even though it doesn't have those poisons or anything in its body, other animals will think that. Um, so some examples of physical or structural adaptation, um, and, and if you can even just think along with me, look at these pictures, we look at that giraffe, that structural adaptation of its long neck, right? So over, you know, thousands of years, uh, the giraffe's neck has gradually gotten longer so that it can reach the top of the trees to uh, get the leaves. So things like body coverings, like fur and feathers, scales, gills and fat would be an example of a physical adaptation. Color, patterns, things like the cheetah where it's blending in with the environment. Uh, that cheetah is, is perfectly designed to blend in with the grasslands uh, in the savanna. Body parts are another example, like beaks and antlers and ears. So having big ears, if, they're, if it was a jackrabbit, they have big ears, or bats have nice big ears so that they can hear um, when they're using echolocation. Claws and the length of the, the neck, like the giraffe is an example. And also things that help defend uh, that animal and keep it safe, like quills, like we just talked about at the beginning. And wow, I didn't even know that uh, is how many quills that uh, um, a porcupine has. That's amazing. Spikes and horns and antlers and teeth are another example of a behavioral or structural adaptation. Okay, last one. So physiological adaptation. Now this one's a little bit more uh, we don't really notice this, but it's, it's kind of happening on the internal or cellular features of an animal. So the inside, it's something that um, they're basically, they're born with, um, and uh, it's just part of them, it's innate, uh, and things like venom and poisons to protect the animal. Reflexes and blinking are kind of an automatic response on how we sense and respond to our environment tolerance to poisons and we'll later talk about that milk production in mammals so you, you see um, uh, that uh, in mammals the ability to produce milk in females uh, is something that just happens and that ensures the survival of um, the species also you'll notice the camel the picture of the camel and so the camels are well designed to live in a desert biome uh, where it's really hot maybe not a lot of water and they can go days and months without water because their body systems are designed to store that water in their tissues and organs so what i thought we would do is watch a little video um, about animal adaptations i'm just going to take off my video here so that you can watch it and uh, Enjoy. Oh. Here we go. Every day, all around us, we can see examples of adaptations within our own species, within species of other animals, and within members of other kingdoms. But simply, an adaptation is a feature of an organism that gives it some sort of benefit or advantage. They could help it build a shelter, find and hunt food, protect itself, or compete against others for mates, food and resources. Adaptations can help it in a range of aspects relating to its survival. Adaptations can be categorised into three main groups, structural or physical, behavioural and physiological. Let's now look at the differences between these groups by looking at some examples. Structural adaptations, also known as physical adaptations, are physical features of the body that assist in some way with survival or reproduction. Some obvious examples include having horns to defend against predators and to compete against others, having fins for aquatic animals who need to swim efficiently, and having armor to defend against predators. 
And camouflage that helps you blend in with your environment is also a very useful adaptation to have. It can help you hide from predators who might be looking for a quick snack. It can also make your prey harder to see you, which allows you to get in close and get a sneak attack. A structural adaptation of a lot of plants is to have brightly coloured flowers which attracts insects and assists with the pollination process. Behavioural adaptations are things that the organism does which gives it some sort of benefit and for the most part these are innate behaviours which means they are born with the ability and the drive to do them. Herding is a great example of a behavioural adaptation. Not only does it help you find food easier as a group, but it also helps you spot predators and raise the alarm. Socialization is another important behavior that's observed in a lot of species. It allows behaviors to be taught to other members of the same species. It allows opportunities for relationships to develop and it promotes cooperation. Setting a trap, like a spider spinning a web, is a great strategy to try and catch some food. Being the most intelligent invertebrate, the octopus is capable of mimicking other animals in order to get closer to its prey. Physiological adaptations are things that the organism's body does without necessarily having to consciously tell it to do so. For example, a distinctive feature of mammals is that the females produce milk, which is a nutrient-rich food source for their offspring. It doesn't choose to produce the milk, but it just does. And in doing so, that's helping the survival of the next generation. Producing poison or venom is another example of a physiological adaptation. A snake or a stingray producing venom and being able to inject that into its prey will help it catch it. And a toad's body producing poison will help deter its predators. In order to summarize what we've covered today, have a look at this snail. I want you to think of a structural adaptation, a behavioral adaptation, and a physiological adaptation. Here are some examples that you could have had. And that's it for today. Okay, just open up my window here, I can. Go. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. Um, so we're going to do a little activity uh, that is uh, I'm just going to do a check in to see what uh, you uh, uh, got from that. So Christine, I think we have a little poll too. Is that right? I do. I'll um, launch that right now. So you can let us know um, what you think an example of a structural adaptation is. Is it the animal's behavior? Is it mimicry, copying something? Is it having thick fur and fat? Or is hibernation an example of a structural adaptation? You can let us know what you think. Okay, I see lots of people are making uh, their decision on which one they think is a structural adaptation. Thanks for letting us know. We'll give it uh, 10 more seconds from here for you to let us know um, which one you think it is. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, three, two, one. Okay, let's see what you said. Okay, we guessed mostly thick fur and fat. Did we get it? Well, let's find out. Let me see if I can get my computer working. And the answer is thick fur and fat. Good job. You know, and I guess a lot of these adaptations, sometimes they sort of um, mesh into the other. So some things, you know, on a physiological level, those structural things happen as well. So um, I can see why some people pick the other ones as well. Okay, so the next one, behavioral adaptation. Okay, an example of a behavioral adaptation is what animals do to survive, thermal regulation, what they do to, for their body temperature, uh, venom or quills. A behavioral adaptation. Is that what animals do to survive? Is that their thermal regulation? Maybe having venom or having quills? You can let us know. Which one do you think it is? Okay, we'll give it uh, 10 more seconds from here for you to decide if you haven't already. 10, 9, 8, 
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we'll see what you said. Okay, we mostly said what animals do to survive. Did we get it? Oh, well, let's find out. What animals do to survive. <laughs> Wow, what a great group. Everyone's, you know, and again, those some of these things sort of overlap. So, um, but I think the best answer for that is the, what they do. All right, last one. Okay, now you're going to let us know what you think is an example of a physiological adaptation. Is it an animal's behavior? Is it migration? Is it uh, the reflexes or blinking or camouflage? Which one is an example? of a physiological adaptation. Okay, you're letting us know what you think is an example of a physiological adaptation. I can see that people are making their choice. Thank you. Um, just a few more minutes to let us know if you haven't decided already. We'll give it 10 more seconds from here. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, one. Okay, we'll see what you said. We guessed camouflage mostly. Well, you know, well, let's find out. <laughs> it's actually reflexes and blinking, but you know, camouflage is a is a is a, a structural uh, adaptation, but really on the cellular level, it's happening too. So it, a lot of these, as I said before, kind of overlap. So good job, everyone. Fantastic. All right, moving right along. So this is the part of the presentation that I get really excited about. And um, it took a long time to figure out, to narrow it down, what animals I wanted to highlight. Um, and so I picked six. And um, I hope you, you enjoy them. Uh, there are so many, there's thousands of different types of animals that have really cool adaptations. And I would encourage you to uh, investigate and learn more. And if there's something you wanna learn or something that I've shared today that you wanna learn more about, I'm gonna share that, Christine, uh, with you so that you can share with, um, with our, uh, um, our, our everyone today. <laughs> and uh, uh, they can learn more if they'd like. All right, so the first animal I wanna tell you about is the wood frog. And some of you already might know about the wood frog, but I just kind of learned about the wood frog just a few years ago. And uh, so this is an amphibian. The wood frog lives in a forest biome um, and they live around this area. So in, around the Columbia Basin and they hibernate, but they do this in a really unique way. So they, on a physiological uh, adaptation, they are actually able to almost completely free. So they become what we call a frogsicle. And what happens is in their body, they have um, glucose from their liver and urea, which is found in urine, which is a waste product. And together those kind of make what we call like an antifreeze. And that goes into the cells of this animal. And everything else on the in-between spaces completely freezes in the wintertime. So basically, this frog is in what we call a suspended animation. So as the temperature goes down below zero, this frog slowly freezes. And it can freeze all winter. And as the temperature increases, and it, it will thaw and come back to life. And then as it cools again, it will freeze again. And this doesn't have an impact on their systems. Their heart stops, their breathing stops, everything stops. And in the springtime, they have the benefit that they don't have to go under mud or in a pond or under leaf litter. They can kind of pretty much freeze on the spot. And so they are one of the first frogs to start to mate. So that really helps their species. So I thought we'd watch a little video. It's just a short video on this particular animal. Wood frogs are the first to awake. This amazing creature lives farther north than any other frog, and it can tolerate freezing. Yeah, that's right. It can freeze and then spring back to life. In this amazing video, you can see a frog frozen solid at negative three degrees Celsius. It has no sign of life, no heartbeat, no breathing, 
no observable brain activity. As the animal gradually warms, life returns. After he warms, he's right back at it, as if nothing has happened. He's ready to breed and create the next generation of frozen frogs. How do they do it? Well, the frog pulls water away from its vital organs and lets it freeze in the in-between spaces. Imagine if we could do this, suspend our lives and lose all signs of life, then spring back when times are good. Though we know how it manages to avoid freezing damage, much of this amazing feat remains a mystery and may well for quite some time. Okay, so the wood frog and it's really cool adaptations. So I'm gonna show you another, if I can get it here. Uh, all right, so the next animal is one that many of you might be familiar with. Uh, driving along the highway, in our parks, uh, in our mountain zones is the bighorn sheep. And uh, the more I learn about this animal, the more I, I, I just think how awesome it is. And uh, so when we think of these rams, these male, um, th these male bighorn sheeps, and the females are called ewes, they both have horns. So unlike deer or caribou or moose or elk, they have antlers. These guys have horns. And so these horns stay with them for the rest of their life, for their entire life. They don't fall off in uh, February, March, and then regrow. They grow all the time. So these guys um, have a few different adaptations that help them survive um, their environment. They live in the, the higher alpine, uh, in um, on mountains, mountainous areas. Um, and so they will start maybe at their feet. So their hooves are actually kind of split and they have a kind of a, a soft cushion on the inside and they're able to um, climb in areas that their predators can't reach them. So that's one of their structural adaptations they have. So their hooves are help them uh, get to places where other animals can't. They also, um, and the males, they have their horns. And you'll notice that these horns are in the shape of a C. And that's part of their um, ability to be able to ram up against each other. Uh, all throughout the year they do this, but in particular during the mating season, uh, rams of the same age will kind of bash heads and they'll ram into each other. And uh, scientists are like, how can they do this? Because what they found is these rams can hit each other at 60 times harder than what it would take for us to actually break our own skull. So the force is unbelievable. It's thousands of pounds of force hitting their horns. So they actually hit with their horns, not their, their heads, um, but it's all sort of connected. Um, and so what's inside their horns, uh, when you look, is that it's kind of, rather than being a solid bone, it's actually kind of like a shock absorber on the inside of their bones. So that takes uh, some of the impact when they hit each other, but also the shape of their bone being in that, that uh, spiral C helps absorb some of that impact. But what's really neat about uh, the bighorn sheep, and this is very similar also to uh, woodpeckers, is that they have this brain that is surrounded by uh, what they call a bubble wrap of blood. So blood comes into their brain and rather than leaving very quickly, it stays there. And so it actually provides some absorption. So when they hit each other, um, it, 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 it doesn't really impact them. Um, so we're going to watch the video uh, showing you this because uh, we don't really get a chance to see this happening in the wild. So we're going to watch this and it's just a short little video. This six-year-old is finally ready to compete. His opponent is a bigger, stronger eight-year-old ram. The 
challenger must provoke the fight. With body kicks and tongue flicking, he taunts his opponent. The older ram seems to walk away in submission. But his posture is known as the low stretch. It means, you want a piece of me? Come get it. All right. Oh, I think I have a headache just watching that. <laughs> All right, so moving right along. Oh. So the next animal I want to share with you is one of my favorite, and I've just uh, discovered this animal over the last few years, working a lot on creeks and streams here in the Kimberley area. And this animal is called the American Dipper. And it's the hardiest kootenai bird out there. It is uh, a songbird, but it is, it's an aquatic songbird. It's the only one that we have. And this, uh, a lot of songbirds, most songbirds leave um, our area. They migrate um, to warmer temperatures, but not this bird. This bird sticks out winter and it has some really cool adaptations on its body, on its feathers uh, and how it can stay warm. So it can dive underneath the water uh, and in the middle of winter where there's ice and snow everywhere. And this bird is just fine. It's so well adapted. Um, it has a super strong beak that it can um, hunt for the little macro invertebrates, those little water bugs that are underneath the water. Uh, and it can also walk on the bottom of the creek. So it is, its legs are well adapted, its, fur, its feathers are well adapted. Uh, and so um, this bird is, is, is one of my favorite. And it's also what we call a water weasel. So here's a little video uh, I captured on Mark Creek. And you can see it dipping along, trying to get the bugs. So, Super cool bug, uh, bird. So if you happen to see this on uh, near any creeks and streams uh, in the summer or in the fall uh, or even in the winter time, if you're walking along a creek and you see a little gray bird uh, that's near the water, uh, chances are it is a dipper or what we call a water oozel. All right. So the next uh, um, animal I want to talk about uh, is the grasshopper mouse and the bark scorpion. And uh, I recently just started watching the Netflix uh, program. It's called Night on Earth. And uh, for those kids out there, you might want to just check with folks, your parents, just to make sure that that's appropriate. Uh, because it, it does talk about the natural history and life and predator-prey relationships between animals. So there are some, um, some interesting scenes. But this is one of the animals I learned about by watching on this show. And this is the grasshopper mouse and scorpion. And if you were to guess which one uh, is the predator and which one is the prey, what do you think you'd, who would you pick? Christine, who would you pick? Hmm, I, I'm thinking about it. Maybe if anyone wanted to type an answer uh, to us, they could let us know. If these two, the grasshopper mouse and the scorpion, uh, were to duke it out, which one do you think would be the winner? I like how you said that. <laughs> See some guesses coming in. I see some people saying scorpion, some people say mouse, scorpion, mouse. We're not sure. It's a tough one because I mean that scorpion looks tough, but that mouse looks pretty tough too. And and I think the sign is he's howling at the moon. So that's yeah. one way they howl. They're, these little mice are known for a stop when they establish their territory. They're very territorial. They're a mouse that you do not want to mess with. Um, and uh, so let's find out. Uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So the, the, the grasshopper mouse and the scorpion both live in a desert biome. Uh, New Mexico is an example uh, in, in, in the desert area. And so this mouse, you see those big, big eyes. So it has, a, uh, it's a nocturnal animal, so it can see very well at night. 
Uh, and uh, as we know, scorpions, when we think of a scorpion, we probably think about its stinging, um, its, its structural adaptation is, uh, well, it's physiological too, is that it has venom. Um, so uh, actually who wins in this one is actually the grasshopper mouse. So the grasshopper mouse has developed uh, an adaptation that it can survive the sting and multiple stings of the scorpion. And we actually have a bat that lives in British Columbia, um, more in the uh, grassland sort of uh, um, Kamloops, Kelowna area, um, called the pallid bat. And the pallid bat is pretty much similar to this mouse um, that it can sustain the stings of uh, scorpions. So the more that the scorpion stings it when the mouse is hunting it and attacking it, actually it acts like a pain reliever. So it, it actually does the opposite. It doesn't hurt it. It actually causes it to stop feeling uh, really any pain from the sting. So let's watch, uh, let's watch uh, this video and I think you'll enjoy it. This is the grasshopper mouse. It has cinnamon colored fur and weighs approximately 25 grams, making it only slightly smaller than the average pet hamster. It's a native mammal of the deserts in the southwestern United States and Mexico, where it shares its habitat with the bark scorpion. Its large black eyes are an adaptation to its nocturnal lifestyle. But it mostly relies on its lightning fast reflexes to survive, which it uses to hunt and eat scorpions. But what really makes this mouse interesting is its ability to immediately turn toxins from scorpion venom into painkillers. The mice have evolved the ability to be stung multiple times, but to remain relatively unfazed and continue attacking the scorpion. Not only is the mouse unfazed, but it actually feels less pain after being stung. All right, so that's a mouse you do not want to mess with especially if you are a bark scorpion. All right, I've got, I think, two more to do. Uh, so uh, this one is probably one of my favorite because I actually teach a program in, at Mainstreams on beaver, um, along with my colleague, Miss Kim. And so the beaver uh, is uh, a North American animal. Actually, there are two different types of beaver, the Eurasian beaver and the North American beaver. And beavers, are uh, an ecosystem engineer. They have the most amazing adaptation, uh, behavioral adaptation, that they are able to construct dams and lodges and food caches um, to help them survive. They build these dams so that they can build up, um, they can block water so they can uh, create an ecosystem that they can live in and be safe. But while doing that, they also create habitat um, for a whole bunch of different animals, moose and birds and bears and insects and macroinvertebrates and fish. And by doing that, um, we call them a keystone species because without the beaver there, um, that uh, those, everything else would sort of fall apart. So beaver are so important on our landscape, but they also have some really cool adaptations. So when uh, I go into classes and I do the beaver program, one of the things we do is we dress up a student to represent all the cool adaptations that beavers have. So I thought I'd uh, just go over a few of those adaptations. So uh, some of the ones that when we think of a beaver, um, probably the first one is their teeth. So being uh, the second largest rodent, they have really large, sharp teeth. And on the outside of their teeth, is kind of like an orangey color and that's iron and that allows the beaver to basically cut down lots of trees and branches and they have to continuously use those teeth so that uh, they can keep them nice and sharp and if they didn't they would continuously grow. Um, they also have fairly small eyes. Um, their eyesight's okay, but what's really neat about their eyes is they have, and you'll notice the, the fellow there has a set of goggles on. And those goggles are representing the nictitating membrane 
that is on the beaver um, and they're on sharks and alligators as well and it's kind of like a, a second eyelid that's clear and it allows the beaver to have some protection so that when it's swimming in its uh, aquatic environment uh, you know there's sticks and debris that it protects its eyes so that's a, another structural adaptation uh, a physiological adaptation of a beaver would be its amazing set of lungs and its respiratory system. So beaver can hold their breath for 15 minutes underwater. How long can you hold your breath for? Um, probably not as long as 15 minutes. So they've uh, adapted and, and uh, evolved to a point where they are able to hold their breath for a long time so they can do other construction of their dam, they can eat underwater, they can eat and or grab things underwater because they also have a flap uh, just behind their teeth that allows them to grab on so that water doesn't go down their throat as well. So they're, they're super uh, well adapted uh, animal to live in the ecosystem they live in. And lastly, um, we notice the beaver has that big uh, fat tail, uh, nice and wide. And some of the purposes of that tail um, is for swimming, is for communication. So if a beaver slaps its tail uh, on the water, that might indicate to a predator that the beaver knows it's there, but also it's signaling to its family that there are predators in the area and to be careful. And it's also used as a, a, a way to help it balance when it's cutting down trees. So the beaver, I don't have a video for that one, but I can put that uh, um, on uh, the website uh, later on today so that you can see that. All right, um, so our next one is, and this is one of my favorite bugs now, I have to say, is the bombardier beetle. And just in its name, uh, bomb, um, that has a very special adaptation. So this beetle um, lives pretty much all over the world, uh, in North America and throughout Asia, um, not in Antarctica, but uh, it, it lives in most places. And what it can do is it, when it feels threatened by a predator, it can expel out of its abdomen um, a hot, about 100 degrees Celsius, acidic liquid from its, its abdomen, and it will squirt it onto it, the predator that's trying to attack it. And um, it's, it's an amazing process that it has in its body two glands that store hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid and an enzyme. And when it feels threatened, those two things combine and the reaction that occurs inside the animal's body causes it to kind of explode or like a bomb explode out of its body and um, to the predator or uh, that's attacking it. Um, so let's watch a little video about this bug. This is one of my new favorite bugs. A mantis. Some mantises are so large and strong they can even kill small birds. A bombardier beetle should be easy. But not this one. A fraction of a second after the mantis strikes, the beetle squirts hot gas and caustic chemicals in its face. are produced by a reaction in its abdomen which generates enough heat to bring the liquid close to boiling point. Bombardier's spray can be deadly to smaller creatures but the mantis is large and it survives. As does the beetle. All right, so not a bug you want to mess with. So I thought what we would do is end off with a, a little animal adaptation game, kind of like the one before with the um, uh, questions about the different types of adaptations. Um, and I thought we would ask a few questions and see what you remembered. Christine, do you have this one? I yeah. do. Um, so I have a question here for you. What special adaptation do beavers have? Let's see if you can remember. Um, do beavers have a hard shell to protect themselves from predators, resistance to venom of scorpions? Do they have well-designed and strong horns and skulls? Do they have web feet, powerful lungs, and sharp front teeth? 
Let's see what you think. Okay, I'll give it five more seconds from here for you to let us know. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what you said. All right, we said web feet, powerful lungs, and sharp front teeth. Wow. Hey, you never know. They, I mean, the venom and the... <laughs> I don't think beavers have venom. <laughs> yeah, right. I, think, the I, think answer, we, I think we got it. I think we got it. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Good job, everyone. All, All right. right, so what? Oh, okay. <laughs> so our next question is, um, what about the grasshopper, grasshopper mouse? Um, what adaptation does it have to survive? Does it spray hot liquid in defense? Um, does it have a, a large tail that it slaps on the water? Can it swim under cold water? Um, or does it survive the sting or the venom of a scorpion? <laughs> okay, I'll give you five more seconds from here to let us know. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what you said. Okay, we said that last one there, that it can survive the venom of a scorpion. Uh, okay, let's find I. You are correct. <laughs> so, all right, moving right along. I think we have uh, maybe one more. Okay, now we're gonna see if we remember about that wood frog from the beginning. What does the wood frog have for its special adaptation? Um, does it have specially designed hooves? Um, does it howl at the moon to mark its territory? Does it spray hot liquid to protect itself? Or can it freeze almost completely and then wake up when it warms up outside? Okay, just a few more moments to let us know what you think. I'll give you five more seconds from here. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what you said. All right, we said that last one, that it can freeze. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> fantastic, wonderful. All right, um, I, I have a few activities that I'd like to share with you guys that you might be able to do at home or with your teacher. Um, and can, Christine, can I go over a few of those and then maybe we'll take some questions? We have Absolutely. Okay, great. So one of the things that you can do at home or with your, your teacher, or your parents, is create your own animal with special adaptations. Uh, so design a creature, name it, where does it live, what special superpower does it have, and maybe think about those three types of adaptations, right? So that physiological, that physical structural, or that behavioral adaptation. And also when you're outdoors, maybe today you're going for a walk, think about the animals and plants that live in your area and what they might need in order to survive and thrive. Think about the food and water and shelter and space. Also noticing maybe the terrain that you live in and type of weather or climate will also help you um, kind of think about that. And then maybe create a brochure or a poster. Pick one animal you really want to learn about and share what biome it lives in and any interesting facts you can find. It's, it's so amazing how much information is out there. And lastly, um, this might be the most popular one, is go outside and build a shelter. Um, that's a, kind of a lost art, I think. Uh, and uh, that's something that I think living in the mountains, living where we live, when we go outside, knowing how to keep ourselves safe, just like animals do when they have to build a shelter. Um, going out and getting a tarp or even just using uh, some sticks uh, is, um, it's really, uh, it's quite fun. And that, that picture of Walt is, uh, he often comes out with us when I take the kids out to do, uh, um, at St. Mary's, comes out and builds shelters with us. So he was guarding the shelter there. <laughs> so that's all I have. <laughs> right. Thank you, Patty. I did get some questions in, so I'll have a, I'll do a few questions now. Um, someone was wondering, do beavers hibernate? No, they do not. Uh, so they build a, an amazing um, dam, uh, lodge 
uh, that is uh, has access from the water and they're able to to hang out and uh, they yeah they survive throughout the winter by swimming underneath um, the uh, the ice um, and they're and they go to their food cache and they get their food and um, so that's why it's really important that they they gather all those things uh, throughout the summer and the fall so that they do not have to go out uh, in the winter time to go find more food because they don't they don't move very fast so no yeah interesting um someone was also wondering how big can bighorn sheep horns get because actually interesting we learned in dave's presentation that horns don't stop growing they don't yeah you know um i and i'm thinking about they continue to grow and and um the weight of them, I'm, and I might be wrong on the, the weight of them, but I think they can be about 30 pounds, quite heavy. Yeah, so just, I, I mean, it, it, and that's where that strong, they have a really strong neck. I mean, they are like in top shape as they get older. And that's why it takes till about six years old that they start to um, get into that mating time because they're at a point where they can also, um, vying for territory or vying for a role in their in their herd um, so often when they fight as well they're only fighting with um rams at their same size and age yeah that's really interesting that 30 pounds would be something would be really heavy to have something attached to your head yeah so cool. i could be wrong but i think that's what i, I read yeah. <laughs> My notes are here. be interesting we can all afterwards we can go look that up i'm curious too i'm gonna look yeah. that up um, <laughs> This was an interesting question of someone was asking, um, how do foxes make dens? And I think actually that could be a really interesting one to look at. Um, maybe what adaptations animals like foxes and bears do this too. What goes into them making a den? If you think yeah. about it, there might be a few things going on there. So foxes making dens, I would say, um, yeah, uh, that digging a den would probably be one way that they would, um, look for somewhere to hide and somewhere to stay. I would say uh, they dig a, they, they would dig a den. Um, you know, you think about a dog and how they like to kind of like dig in the sand or in the, in the ground. So very similar that way. Wolves are the same way where they will dig, um, you know, in the ground to, to make a, a den for themselves. So um, that so might be something that they might learn from watching their their parents growing, like when they're little, maybe yeah. they learn to, they see that behavior. They also have a cool physiological adaptation if they're able to dig those. Actually, I guess it would be structural, wouldn't it? If they're able to dig, they must have really good digging claws. Absolutely, so those claws, um, just, you know, powerful. I mean, when we look at a, a grizzly bear, that hump on their back, you know, that's that um, relates to the ability to actually dig. And that's, uh, that's part of that, uh, that structural sort of adaptation on their bodies that gives them that power. So yeah, digging would be the way they would construct and learning from their parents as well. Beavers are the same way. Um, the kits will learn from their, 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 their family, their mom and their, 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 their mother and their father, they'll teach them how to do all that. I think it's an instinctual drive. They want to, to do that. They want to stop water. When they hear water, they want to build something to, to stop that. And that's sort of a, 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 almost like a physiological behavioral response. Um, <laughs> and, and, but they also learn from their parents how to do it well. It's really interesting. It's yeah. interesting thinking about these animals will have these fast, these things that they do um, and all of these adaptations almost kind of work together to help them be successful. Um, so they might, there might be layers of adaptations like an animal who has a, has, you know, wants to build a den. They learn, they learn to do it by watching. They have an instinct where they want to do it. And then they also have these great structural adaptations that make them really good at doing it. Fascinating. Yeah. You know, and one thing, Christine, and, and to everyone, you know, one thing that when we think about animal adaptations, you know, we're trying to live in, in harmony with animals, right? The, we're all neighbors here in this, this neighborhood called Earth and working together. And when we have, make impacts on the landscape and, and our land use practices, you know, and, and the habitat of animals is impacted, they they can't adapt to the how quickly um, we're changing the landscape so i think of uh, an animal like the mountain caribou for instance and how they're so well adapted to living up in the in the high alpine um and but they're not really well adapted to defending against predators because they've never had to deal with that 
And when we change the landscape, um, we're kind of allowing, um, providing corridors for predators to come in uh, and the animals aren't really used to, to seeing that. And they don't have the, the adaptation to deal with that. So, and they can't learn quickly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Those adaptations, they take a long time to develop, especially like things like physical adaptations, um, behavioral adaptations too, even like if you're used to doing things a certain way, it's really hard to change your habits. And we're, we're living that right now, aren't we? Right. Mm -hmm. So I teach this program outside usually. <laughs> so I'm having to adapt, right? Like we all are. So. All right. I think that we're really close to uh, time to wrap up for today, Patty. Is there any last things that you want to say um, before we wrap up for today? Oh, I just want to say thank you so much to Seabean for hosting uh, these webinars. It's been, I've enjoyed watching it so much as well. And I just encourage people to, to keep learning about these animals because they're, they're, it's so fascinating. And get outside. <laughs> so thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, I think we'll stop there for today. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, you'll get an email with these activities onto the email that you signed up for the presentation with, or you can also go to cbean.ca slash wild voices online. We're putting the activities up there as well afterwards. All right, have a great day, everyone. Bye. <laughs>